What's up top 10 fam? Hope you're having an awesome day. I'm your host Eamon Hassan and welcome back to another video. Now I feel antiques always have an element of creepiness to them since they are so old and have so much backstory attached that I mean could be good, could be bad, we don't really know. Or worse, it could just be straight up haunted. And then you know you're just royally screwed so where do you even go from there? Before we get into the video guys, check out the merch. Look how cute I look, look how cute it is. You can use MA10 for $5 off on the website so go check it out. But on that note, let's talk about the top 10 haunted antiques you should never own. Starting us off at number 10 is the Bassano Vase. And this one comes with its fair share of baggage to say the least. So the Bassano Vase is a silver vase that was made sometime in the 15th century, so it definitely qualifies as antique. And before you guys are like, it's vase, it's not. <laughs> now the story goes like this, a young bride was gifted the vase the night of her wedding, but she never ended up making it to the altar that night. She was murdered the same night with the vase in her hand and the murderer was just never caught. As an homage to her, the vase was passed down in her family but whoever seemed to get it would meet a horrible fate soon after. The vase owners all met unexpected deaths, so much so the family decided to box the vase away altogether. However, in 1988 it resurfaced and was found with a note that said beware, this vase brings death. Well, no sh Karen. Whoever found the vase failed to include that note when he later auctioned off the vase, so the pharmacist who ended up buying it died three months later. A surgeon was next in line to buy it and he too died within two months, despite only being 37 years old. Next up in line was an archaeologist, dead within two months, and the owner after that died within one month. So already that's four deaths, not even including the ones from the original family owners, and that's a lot. When the lid of the vase is removed, it's meant to almost attract people that have murderous intentions towards it and so what ends up happening is that it successfully does attract those killers and then those killers just murder the vase's owner. Italian newspapers claim the police confiscated it and buried it in a lead box in an unknown location and it's probably for the best. I'm not trying to die by no goddamn vase. Like nah. What a cop out death. I'm not here to be such a you know live savage and then be killed by a vase. Like that's just not happening for me. <laughs> Coming in at number 9 is Busby stoop chair aka the dead man's chair. Lovely, great, what a time to be alive. <laughs> well clearly not. Now this chair is apparently haunted by the infamous murderer Thomas Busby. Now Busby was hanged in 1702 for murdering his father-in-law Daniel. Now the reason he killed him is varied. One story claims they were in business together and had an argument and Thomas lost his temper and then he killed him. The other story is that Daniel sat on his chair without permission and then he killed him. Either way both are pretty ridiculous but again one of them has to have happened. Now right before Thomas was executed, he was granted his final request and his was to have a last drink in his chair. And as he sat on it, he said death shall come swiftly to anyone that dares to sit in my chair. Because frankly, he was salty and wanted to watch the world burn. And he successfully did. Since that moment, death actually has come to many, many people who have sat on the chair. So much so, the landlord actually donated it to the Thirsk Museum. But even they had trouble with people wanting to sit on it and commit suicide so they actually had to hang it from the ceiling. Can you imagine this chair is so screwed that they actually had to hang it from the ceiling so people wouldn't sit on it and kill themselves? Like, y'all, y'all on some bull <laughs> At number 8 we have the wedding dress. Now this one is just sad and filled with sorrow and just simply not fun. So back in 1849, Anna Baker, the daughter of a very rich family, fell in love with a low class iron worker. Ah, the classic classist conundrum. My English teacher would have loved that alliteration and honestly I did too. Even though it was hard to say, not gonna lie, it did take me a few takes. Either way, she was hell bent on marrying this boy despite knowing her father would never accept it. She begged him, she pleaded with him, but he refused to budge. Well, let's face it guys, when a girl wants a boy, believe me, she will do anything to be with him, me included. Hopeless romantic, what can I say? Either way, Anna even bought a wedding dress in hopes they would get married one day and that day just never came. Her dad bought the iron mill her boyfriend worked for and had him moved to a different city and so in anger and protest, Anna promised her dad she would never marry anyone regardless of how many suitors they brought in for her. When her father finally died, her true love was also gone so she spent her days angry and 
alone, which is understandable, I'd be fuming too. Her servants, who had been in the house since she was little and basically raised her, were sad when they used to see her dancing and walking around the house in the wedding dress. They felt like a part of her had died a long time ago, and they were right. She passed away in 1914, and the Baker's Mansion was turned into a museum, and that dress was put in a glass case inside her bedroom. Visitors report seeing a woman look back at them through the glass when they look at the dress, which could mean she's very much still wearing it even in the afterlife. Others say they've seen the dress move despite there obviously being no wind inside the glass case. Whichever you saw, whatever you want to believe, this is a sad story. Love story. RT if you cry every time. I certainly do. Filling on number 7 slot is the necklace. Now this story was shared by one of CT Post's readers and she said she was gifted an antique glass necklace by her husband's family. But whenever she would wear it, she would always, always have an accident involving water. She'd knock over a glass, a flower vase would break, someone would drop their drink on her, she even fell into the pool at one point. Despite all these happenings, the woman never attributed them to the necklace until one day her mother-in-law came over and said how nice it was to see her wearing the necklace. She went on to say it belonged to her great aunt and that she was actually a survivor of the Titanic. So I mean that makes a lot more sense, bloody hell, like I get it now. So either the reader is extremely clumsy or the necklace is haunted by the bad juju of the Titanic. There's just no in between. It's one or the other. Now at number 6 is Robert. Now Robert is a haunted doll that was owned by painter and author Robert Eugene Otto and yes he named the doll after himself. Narcissistic, we know. But we don't talk about it, it's fine. Now there are two origin stories about how the doll fell into Robert's hands. Now the first is that his granddad got it in Germany and gave it to him as a birthday gift back in 1904. And the other is that their servant gave him the doll as either a gift or as revenge for getting fired. I'd go with the latter. Now either way, however he got it, he became very obsessed with it and basically took it with him everywhere he went. Now looks wise, it is very creepy. It's a straw filled doll wearing a sailor's outfit with holes in its face, no mouth and just a not very nice looking thing all around. It's just not ideal. And it was quite big as well so I'm like Robert how did you carry this around with you? It's probably as big as you. Either way, legend has it the doll was aware of its surroundings and its facial expressions would change. The servant girl had a background in voodoo and hence the doll was apparently able to move as well. The family would hear it giggle and it would move things around Robert's room. Robert's parents even started seeing him talk to himself in two completely different voices when no one was around and then they soon moved it to the attic away from him where it stayed till Robert got married and then later died. Apparently the doll disappeared after Robert's death and after his house was sold to various different people. Now the doll caused the future house owners a lot of horrible mishaps, broken bones, car accidents, divorce, losing their jobs and more. The doll was then donated to the East Martello Museum in 1994 where people who visited it reported going through misfortunes after seeing the doll. So it's safe to say this doll just has beef with everyone in general. Coming in at number 5 is everything in the shop. Not even an exaggeration, I swear to god. So back in 2017, Daniel Parker, an antiques dealer working at Barnes the Antique Centre saw something in the store CCTV cameras. He came into work that day and saw a rocking deer toy from the 60s on the ground when he 100% knew it was very much on the shelf before he left the day before. When rewinding the footage, you can see the toy moving on its own just straight up. Nothing is near it to make it move, it just moves for a while before getting pushed to the ground. Now Daniel said he tried recreating the movement and making it sway to see if it would fall on its own and it didn't. He claims there have been hundreds of unexplained events in the two years he's owned the shop that he's never gotten to the bottom of. Customers blamed the ghosts of little children running around inside the shop but he doesn't buy it. Paintings in the shop have even moved and a cabinet once randomly exploded with zero trigger. His 11 year old daughter even went into the basement of the shop one day to explore and she ran out screaming claiming an arm had grown grabbed her. Daniel. You may be in denial, but I am certainly not. I feel like a child's ghost is like attached to each of the antiques in the store, which is just not a great selling point to be honest. Maybe include that bit, maybe include the haunting part in like the fine print. Don't say it outright. <laughs> loopholes. Eamon's loopholes 101. Now apparently the site where the shop is used to be a mill in the 1800s and the mill owner hanged himself in the 60s right in the middle of where the shop is right now. So I mean, it could be a bunch of kids or this bored mill owner's ghost, we don't really know. Either way. There are ghosts, there are haunted items that we don't want. No, no more items. At number four is the skull of Anne Griffith. Now, technically, you can't own the skull unless you live in the place it's located, which is Burton Agnes Hall in Yorkshire. Now, Agnes Hall is a proper Tudor mansion.
Revolution and 300 years ago it was owned by the three daughters of Sir Henry Griffith who we don't need to know about because he's irrelevant, he's probably one of the you know bougie dukes and sirs that there's just so many of in England. Either way, all three loved the house and did their best to make it the best it could possibly be, especially Anne. But one night on the way back from visiting friends, Anne was attacked by some highwaymen. Her body was left for dead outside, but she was brought back to the house, but sadly died a few days later. While being half in and out of consciousness in her last few days, she told her sisters her soul wouldn't rest unless a part of her could stay in our beautiful home as long as it shall last. She made them promise to sever her head after she died and keep at Agnes Hall. But after she died, her sisters couldn't bring themselves to do it, which I don't blame them for, and so her body was buried in the churchyard, but then her full on ghost walked into the house and scared the hell out of everybody. Way to make an entrance, Anne. She would slam doors in the house, things would fall all over the place, and there was always a painful groaning sound echoing in the corridors at night. Her sisters eventually consulted the local vicar, who told them to exhume the body and keep their promise. Come on guys, we don't break promises, especially in death. Let's not do that. Her grinning, hideous skull, not my words, the articles, was then placed in the home and all the scary occurrences just stopped. A few years passed though and a servant of the house threw the head away onto a cart and the horse leading it immediately stopped and refused to move. It was lashed a bunch of times and still didn't move and the girl had to eventually admit that she did it and the skull was returned. Then another family owned the house years later and buried the skull in their backyard but then started experiencing horrible hauntings and they too had to bring the skull back in. So in conclusion, don't mess with Catherine Ann Griffiths. Mic drop. Filling our number 3 slot is The Foot Book by Dr. Sue. So apparently the backstory of this one is pretty messed up and I don't know why I'm saying apparently because I've read it and it is. It was owned by a family that reported hearing children's voices whispering around their house every time their daughter read it. As if the voices weren't bad enough, they felt this overwhelming unsettling feeling of being watched which they just couldn't shake. They called in paranormal investigator Shane Burgey who found out that the book was bought in a yard sale from a house where a quadruple homicide had taken in place. One of the victims was a two year old girl and after more in depth analysis they found out that the stain on the cover of the book wasn't just dust or food, it was a blood stain. Nah, B? And now imagine being so happy giving this book to your kid and then realizing ages after she's been reading a murder blood stain book this whole time, I'd be like ugh, uh, child services just come take her away now, I failed. Shane took it from the family and donated it to the National Museum of the Paranormal in West Virginia and that was the end of that. So I I mean you can't own it yourself but you can look at it, just don't touch and don't read. Now at number 2 is the Women of Lem statue, also known as the Goddess of Death statue. Now the statue was carved from pure limestone and was found in Lemba in Cyprus back in 1878 but was actually made sometime in 3500 BC. Now looks wise it doesn't really look like a woman but I mean art is subjective right, it can look like anything. It has two sort of stub arms coming out on the side and then another rounder pair underneath them and I can kind of see how it kind of resembles a body but also not. Now the first person to own the statue was Lord Elfont but within 6 years of having it, all 7 members of his family died in very bizarre ways. The next owner was Evil Minucci whose entire family also died within 4 years of getting it. Then comes Lord Thompson Knoll whose entire family also died within 4 years as well. Now after murdering various entire families, the statue disappeared off the radar for a bit and then re-emerged in the hands of Sir Alan Biverbrook. Yes, all the owners had bougie fancy names because it was the olden days you guys, let's just sweep under the rug. They all sounded like a Winston or a Churchill and like god knows what. I'm not hating before you guys are like, you're a hater. Either way, Biverbrook, his two kids and his wife died later that year but before it could take his two sons, they realised hey, our lives kind of became shit after we got the statue, maybe it's the statue. So they quickly donated the statue to the Royal Scottish Museum but then the museum's curator who took care of the statue died in the same year. So really the statue stops at nothing. The statue is now in a glass case and can't hurt anyone else and ironically it was originally meant to be a fertility statue for an unspecified goddess but then obviously became the goddess of death. Accurate. Facts. Straight facts. And finally at number 1 are the Tormans bunk beds. I know right, how could bunk beds possibly be scary? Well you're about to find out. So this may be the newest thing on our list since the bunk beds were bought by the Talman family in 1987. They bought them for $100 which by the way, a bargain number 1 and a red flag number 2. They assembled it and then stored it in their basement. When they finally moved the bed upstairs, that's when things started going horribly wrong. For the next 9 months the family were constantly terrorised. 
The children started getting sick regularly and their son Danny said his clock radio started turning on by itself and switching channels and its vindicator just moved by itself. His parents didn't believe him till it happened to his dad Alan. Now Alan was painting the walls in the basement and put the brush on the table. He went up to eat and came back to find the brush in the bucket bristles up. Sus. Very sus. When his daughter was sleeping in the bed itself she said she saw a red eyed witch behind her door one night and the next night saw fire spread in her room and then disappear into thin air. Danny said he saw the exact same thing the night after. They called in a pastor who was sure there was an evil demonic presence in the house and he was right. Banging doors, weird voices calling out and hallucinations for days. Now days before Christmas Danny saw something so horrific he cried asking his parents to just move house. Like end it all people. Alan was done by that point and then cried out and was like hey if you want to fight someone you ghosts fight me. And so they did. Three weeks later he got home from a late night shift at 2am and heard howling from the garage. He went in and heard a voice saying come here. No one was there but suddenly a fire ignited right in front of him. He ran to get an extinguisher but when he came back there was absolutely no fire, not even remnants of a fire. He then started sleeping next to his daughter to protect her but saw a fog one night that whispered you're dead to him. A relative even watched the children one night and reported seeing the same figure the kids had seen and screamed her lungs out. Two weeks later they had had enough, finally took them bloody long enough and then they destroyed the bunk beds and the haunting stopped completely. Damn B. Ain't nobody got time for that. But also bunk beds are just very uncomfortable. I used to share one with my sisters. Poh. Nah. And that's it for today's video guys. Like honestly I thought this video would be hard to do because I feel like I've talked about haunted objects quite a bit on the channel. Yet surprisingly the world is filled with haunted objects and unsettled spirits so I guess we'll just never run out of to talk about. Don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing but let me know what you thought in the comments below. As always I'm your host Eamon Hassan and I'll catch you in the next one. Bye.